Hey what's up folks, today we're going to learn a little bit more about the battle on Wake Island. Now this battle took place between US forces and the Japanese Empire on an island in the northwestern part of the Pacific Ocean. And I guess as far as latitude is concerned, it's almost halfway between Australia and Japan. I cannot wait for this, I've always heard small stories about this you know, very intriguing battle. I know it took place at around the same time as the battle on Pearl Harbor. And the guy who's going to be detailing the story for us is none other than the fat electrician, the best storyteller on YouTube. Let's go. During World War II, the Japanese military used to think that the Marines were all recruited from prisons and insane asylums, which, to be honest, it's always made sense to me. But after researching for this video, it's starting to make dollars. Can't wait for this one, guys. Today we're talking about the first time that the United States this Marine Corps would come toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Japanese military. Ladies and gentlemen, Wake Island, a small coral atoll 2,000 miles west of Hawaii, closer to Japan than it was to America, and highly sought after by the Japanese to be a forward operating base for World War II. The only problem with that was, it yep. was currently held by the Americans. 450 Marine Corps artillerymen and 1,200 civilian construction workers, as well as 70 Navy corpsmen. In this context, for the layman, if you don't know, Navy corpsmen is a fancy word for Marine Corps medic, aka Doc. And they didn't have much to defend the island with, but they did have six five-inch coastal artillery guns that were actually taken from America's first ever battleship, the original USS Texas from the 1800s. They Beautiful. also had 12 three-inch anti-aircraft guns, 18 M2 Browning machine guns, 30 Browning 30 caliber machine guns, as well as 12 Grumman F4F Wildcat fighters. In regards to time, so just take into account, this is around 1941. So this is right in the middle of the Second World War. And Wake Island is 22 hours ahead of Hawaii, meaning that from their perspective, Pearl Harbor would take place on December 8th, 1941. An hour after the attack on Pearl Harbor had ended, Wake would receive a transmission saying that Pearl Harbor had occurred and that they needed to be prepared. Two hours after that, 27 Japanese bombers would conduct an air raid on Wake Island, destroying eight of their 12 F-4F Wildcat fighters before they even left the airstrip. At the so I knew it was around the same time as the battle on Pearl Harbor, but I didn't know it was exactly the same time. So you can imagine how scary of a time this must have been for the United States, two of their bases being attacked. Ooh, so at least, at the very least, it seems like the guys on Wake Island would have got, you know, some sort of warning that they might be attacked very soon. So let's see how they prepared for that. At this point, 400 civilian construction workers would volunteer to help fight if it came to that, and the Marines began training them on how to operate machine guns immediately, while also fortifying fighting positions. Wake Island would then be bombed again on the 9th, and on December 11th, 1941, an entire Japanese naval detachment would arrive at Wake Island, and the battle for Wake would officially begin. As the Marines, the Navy corpsmen, and the construction workers rushed to their battle stations, they would see that they were incredibly outmanned and out gun. The Japanese had brought with them three wow. light cruisers, six destroyers, three submarines, one submarine tender, two PT boats, and two amphibious landing ships equipped with 450 special naval landing forces of the Japanese, which is essentially the Japanese equivalent of Marines. As yeah. the entire Japanese naval detachment advanced closer and closer to the island, they would finally come within striking distance of the Marine artillery, 12,000 yards. Despite that, and much to the confusion of the Marines, they were all ordered to hold their fire. Which made absolutely no sense to them. These men could hit bullseyes at 12,000 yards. These guys would put a fucking 5 inch shell through a bedroom window if they wanted to. Why on earth are they being told to hold their fire? But the man in charge of the Marines, Commander Devereaux, realized that the Japanese artillery on the ships actually outranged the Marine artillery mm. and they weren't firing yet. And this must mean that the Japanese thought that their air raids had disabled all of the Marine defenses on the island, which was not true at all because in reality the only thing they had taken out was the original 8 Wildcats from day 1. So under the command of Major Devereaux, the Marines would continue to hold their fire and play possum as the entire detachment advanced closer and closer. 10,000 yards, 8,000 yards, 6,000 yards, 4,000 yards, which as far as a Marine artilleryman is concerned, is point blank fucking range. If they got any closer, these Marines were going to try to put a bayonet on this 5-inch gun, okay? The you can imagine the tough position that the commander would have been under because, yes, although the Marines had a direct target... You know, they knew that they were outmatched as far as the quantity um, of forces coming their way, as well as they were outgunned as far as the capabilities of the machinery. So it's a very, very tough position to be in. And I guess that's why he delayed their fire for so very long. 
the Marines would finally be given the order to open fire and they would open fire with everything they had and put as many shells downrange as they possibly could, taking the Japanese completely off guard and hitting almost all of their ships with effective fire. In a matter of minutes, they were able to sink one of the destroyers by hitting it twice in its wow. magazine. The destroyer Hayate would be sunk in 12 minutes. And I cannot stress to you what a big deal this is. At this point in time, Japan has effectively attacked Pearl Harbor and 27 other locations in the Pacific, and they have never lost a single naval vessel. And it took the Marine artillerymen 12 minutes to put one completely under the waterline. Panicking and not knowing what to do, the Japanese naval detachment would turn and retreat. And it is at this point that they would realize that they made a fatal flaw in their attack strategy because they didn't bring a carrier and they brought no planes for air support. Cue this man, Henry Elrod, AKA Hammer and Hank, and one of the first main characters that would ever enter the battlefield in World War II on America's behalf. Himself and the other three Grumm and Wildcat fighters would take off into the sky. They would realize that the Japanese naval detachment came with no carrier and no airplanes overhead. And let's face it, Japanese AA guns might as well be crewed by fucking stormtroopers because they can't hit shit. So the four <laughs> Wildcat pilots take off and proceed to kick the entire naval detachment in the ass on the way out as they strafe their decks with machine gun fire and drop 100 pound bombs on their decks. Now, a 100 pound bomb and machine gun fire absolutely should never be able to sink a major naval vessel, like ever. Good old Hammer and Hank, though, managed to park one of those 100 pound bombs directly on top of the deck depth charges on top of the deck of the destroyer Kisarage, setting off a chain reaction that would sink the entire naval vessel. Which is literally the equivalent of killing a grown ass man with a BB gun, but somehow he pulled it off anyways. Wow. Which I mean to be fair is just standard behavior for the Marine Corps at this point. Now, the smoke settles from the battle and they have to figure out what all happened because, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. Come to find out, the only thing that the Marines lost, two of the planes were so damaged that they weren't going to be flyable anymore, so now they're only down to two Grumman Wildcats and only five people had been injured, nobody died on the American side. Japan, on the other hand, had lost two destroyers, a submarine, and a suspected 300 plus men. Needless what? to say, the Japanese are fucking pissed and embarrassed about this entire thing. Which So at this point, 300 Japanese people have lost their lives in comparison to zero Americans. You can definitely imagine that they are going to come back with a lot of vengeance because they're not just going to you know, die lying down, that's for sure. Which, I mean, they kind of have a right to be upset, too. I mean, this was the first two ships they've had sunk during World War II. This was the first tactical loss they've had. And this is the only successful amphibious landing defense using coastal artillery ever in all of World War II. They, they straight up kind of got their asses whooped. And because they're so upset, they pretty much immediately sent out another air raid from the Marshall Islands and bombed Wake Island again. And they continued to bomb Wake Island every day for the next 10 days. Thankfully, they still didn't manage to hit a whole lot. Total stormtrooper energy just misses every single time. And during this 10 days, the American people would find out that 450 Marines and a bunch of construction workers stood up to the Japanese Navy and told them to get fucked. And this became the silver lining for the catastrophe that was Pearl Harbor. Wake Island was a shining example that the American public looked to and said, if those 450 dudes were able to accomplish that when they weren't ready, imagine what we're gonna be able to do once we actually start trying. This victory unfortunately would be short lived because it is now a race between Japan and America to see who can get reinforcements to Wake Island first. The problem with that is the Japanese reinforcements are coming from all their other successful attack missions, including Pearl Harbor. So they have a huge head start on the Americans. So obviously Obviously, they get all of their ships there first. So the Marines call up the Navy chain of command and are like, hey, there's a bunch of more Japanese ships here, including some aircraft carriers. Um, hurry up. At which point the United States Navy or maybe not the Navy, but the government, somebody at a high level decides that, well, we don't want to lose any more ships. So we're just going to consider all of Wake Island collateral damage and we're going to leave all of you there to die. Damn. I wish I was joking. So the first Damn. battle for Wake Island was on December 11th. They then got bombed every day for 10 days straight. It is now December 22nd. They have all been left there to die, except these are United States Marines. So fuck it. We're still going to fight anyways, because that's just how they get down. So can you guys just try to imagine yourself in their position for a second, knowing that you're going to be totally outmatched, totally outgunned. It's only 450 of you that are trained for the situation. And there may be a few hundred of the civilians have now been armed and taught in the last couple of days, but you know that you've got this terrible fate destined for you, yet you're going to fight anyway. 
That is the bravery of these people during these times. They had to grow up very, very quickly. Some of these folks were still teenagers. It's very, very scary to think about. So December 22nd, 1941, the second battle for Wake Island is about to kick off. In the red, white, and blue corner, we have 450 Marine artillerymen, 400 construction workers, and 70 Navy corpsmen going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a reinforced Japanese Navy of... Three light cruisers, six destroyers, two PT boats, two amphibious landing vehicles, a bunch of more amphibious landing soldiers, one submarine tender, two submarines, four heavy cruisers, two mine layers, and two aircraft carriers returning from Pearl Harbor. The IJN hear you, and the IJN see you. Apparently, the IJN smell you and taste you were fucking busy. And now, to the Marine Corps' surprise, the entire naval detachment refuses to get anywhere near this island, not willing to come within 12,000 yards because they don't want to get shot up by accurate marine artillery fire again. So instead, what they do is they send out their two amphibious landing ships with 900 soldiers on them, and they deploy every single plane that their aircraft carriers have. The two remaining Marine Corps Wildcat fighters are about to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with 50 Japanese aircraft. And somehow, those two badass marine aviators managed to shoot down 21 Japanese ah. planes. One of which was the bomber of bombardier Nirobu Kanai, the man that was credited with sinking the USS Arizona. This would be considered the first ever revenge for Pearl Harbor. The remaining Japanese planes then proceeded to bomb and strafe the island with machine gun fire. They didn't really do a whole lot of damage, but one thing they did take out was the communication lines leaving the command bunker where Major Devereaux was. And nobody knew that that had happened, so Major Devereaux's inside of his bunker giving orders, but nobody's hearing them. So when the 900 Japanese Special Naval Landing Forces landed on the beach and they weren't given any orders, the Marines are kind of like, what are we doing? What's the play? No orders came through, so they're gonna do what Marines do best, be default aggressive, and go fuck shit up. Given a lack of instruction, they will resort to destruction every single time. The Marines on their own accord decide that they are going to fix bayonets, leave the machine guns and fortified fighting positions with the civilians that they trained, and they are gonna go meet a two to one battle against the Japanese special landing forces on the beach in the middle of bum fuck nowhere in the Pacific. One of these two groups is the best amphibious fighting force on earth, and they are about to figure it out right now. For the next 11 hours, the Marine Corps and the Japanese Special Landing Forces would engage in close combat, and not only were the Marines successful at defending, they would begin launching counterattacks, and these counterattacks would fracture the enemy line, sending small groups of enemy soldiers all over the island. It is at this point, after like 11 hours, Commander Devereaux finally comes out of his fucking bunker after not hearing from anyone this entire time, and in his head, he's thinking all of the positions that had radios must have been overrun. That's why they're not responding to me, so he's anticipating that they're losing. And as soon as he walks out of the bunker, he sees Japanese flags all over the island. And he assumes that the flags had been hoisted because the Japanese were victorious. But that's not what was happening. What he was seeing was Japanese good luck flags, which was a Japanese tradition in World War II, where the Japanese soldiers would have their friends and family sign a Japanese flag, and they would hang it on their rifle when they went into battle for good luck. That is what he was seeing, not flags hoisted in victory because his Marines were kicking their fucking ass. But he didn't the fact that it took him 11 hours, though, I think was very, very costly. You know, his his troops were without his leadership that whole time. So definitely very, very costly to not, you know, check up on things once he realized no communication was coming back to him didn't know that so he proceeded to go around the island and force his men to surrender right off the bat huge problem the japanese at this point in time weren't real big on the whole taking prisoners thing they still very much believed in the bushido code of honor and if you surrendered on the battlefield you lost that honor and as far as they're concerned if you didn't have your honor you deserve to die so it's already not looking that great and it would become even worse once the fog of the battle finally lifted and everybody began to look around and realize there's a distinct lack of dead americans plenty of dead people not many Americans. Because over the last 11 hours, the Japanese landing forces had suffered 600 casualties. And the Americans had only lost 52 Marines and 70 construction workers. I say... So they came in with 900 Japanese soldiers uh, and 600 had died. So now it's 300. So at this point, it seems like a much more even battle as far as men are concerned. So yeah, it's interesting that America eventually surrendered this.
day only. That's still a lot. It's way too many. It's tragic. I'm not trying to diminish that in any way. I'm simply trying to explain it was an extremely lopsided battle, and this would only serve to infuriate the Japanese even more. So the Japanese, now thoroughly pissed off, decide they are going to take every American on Wake Island, including the civilians that didn't even fight, and strip them all butt naked and tie them together in groups of 15 with telephone wire and march all 1,600 of them to the airfield. Here's a question for you guys. I don't know the absolute inner details of this battle, but do you believe if the commander did not surrender, if he wasn't, if he didn't make that error in his decision, do you believe that America would have actually won this battle if they didn't actually surrender? It would have, it would be interesting to know because it seems like they were getting the better of Japan in this battle. They then began assembling their crew served machine guns, intending on executing everyone. They then stood there for two days on an airstrip, two butt days. naked in the middle of the Pacific at gunpoint until the Japanese admiral came out and announced to them that the emperor of Japan had decided to grace them with their lives. You see, the American media had made such a big deal of the first defense of Wake Island that the entire world was watching the events unfold now, and Japan knew that they couldn't get away with committing such a mass atrocity without attracting too much attention, so they decided they were going to actually have to abide by the rules of war and take prisoners. The majority of the Americans would then be loaded onto cargo ships and sent to prison camps either in Japan or Japanese-occupied China. And I'm happy to say that the overwhelming majority of them survived all of World War II in these POW camps and wow. got to return home in 1945 that and 1946. Upon returning home, they would find out that only months after their first defense of Wake Island, in 1942, Hollywood had turned their life events into a movie. But the problem with the movie was that nobody actually knew what happened at the Second Battle of Wake Island, so Hollywood just anticipated that everybody had died, and that's how the movie ended. Fast forward like 45 years later, there's a Wake Island reunion event where a journalist finally asks all the Marines what they thought of that movie when they first returned home. And without skipping a beat, this man in his 60s or 70s at this point chimes in and says, well, first of all, we didn't actually have a dog there. To which every other Marine began laughing, and it is hands down my favorite part of this story, <laughs> because somehow that man lived through an entire lifetime worth of shit before he turned 25, and he has now made it into the twilight years of his life with his sense of humor intact and that innate burning desire to be a fucking smartass that every military remember I've ever met you a bit And now, the story's gonna get weird. Whatever became of Wake Island itself, while it would remain under Japanese control for the duration of World War II, every time an American naval vessel drove past it, they would open fire on it with its guns, and they would routinely perform air raids on the island. Now, as fate would have it, one of those air raids on Wake Island would be the very first combat mission of a new pilot that joined the military at the ass end of World War II, and that pilot's name was George Bush. Don't worry, it's gonna get weirder. Returning oh, wow. now to the men as they were currently serving as prisoners of war, the vast majority were held That's in- obviously not uh, the recent president, but his father who was also the president. POW camps in Japanese-occupied China. Of all the men held there, a single Marine would escape, and he would make his way all the way to Northern China, where he would find a group of Chinese communist soldiers, also not super big fans of the Japanese at this point in time, and they would decide, hey, the enemy and my enemy is my friend, I'm gonna make sure this Marine makes it home safe, and that's exactly what they did. And just as that Marine was about to set off on his final journey home, he would receive a visit from those soldiers' leader, and that leader would wish him well on his journey and gift him with several very nice Chinese Chinese rugs. That leader's name was Mao Zedong, the deadliest human of all time, credited with killing somewhere between 40 wow. and 80 million people. No way. Yeah, the truth is literally stranger than fiction. And all of this happening, I have so many questions, but most important of all, the one question I want an answer to more than anything. What do you think that guy did with the rugs? I mean, for real, on one hand, Kind of weird to keep them. But on the other hand, the rug didn't do anything and it's a nice fucking rug. You know what I mean? Okay, this video is getting out of hand. I have to end it. In conclusion, after Pearl Harbor, the commander of the Japanese Navy, Admiral Yamamoto, would write in his personal diary, quote, I fear all we have done is awoken a sleeping giant and filled him with terrible resolve. And I personally find it ironic that the first time that his men would come face to face with that terrible resolve, the sleeping giant that they awoken, would be three days later at Wake Island, where 450 Marines, 70 Navy corpsmen, and 400 blue collar construction workers stood together and halted the most powerful Navy on the planet That's in their crazy. tracks for 16 days. If crazy. you made it this far, well, folks, thanks for watching. That was absolutely fascinating. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I can't help but think about what must have been going through those people's minds when at the end, they were all lined up 
no clothes, no food, no water, and had a gun pointed at them for two days. Absolutely terrible, see, terrible scenes. Very, very overjoyed actually to hear that they did survive. Very, very glad for that indeed. They definitely deserve to go home eventually safe and sound. But folks, let me know what you thought about the Battle of Wake Island. Bad electrician, he's done it again. What an absolute amazing storyteller. And if you did enjoy the video as much as I did, please remember to leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. I'd highly appreciate it. But folks, that's all I have for you today. So until next time, I hope you have a good one. I'll see you when I see you. Cheers.